<clears throat> uh, nice to meet you all. Thanks for coming. So as Jordan's introduced me already, I'm an ST5 doing cardiac and oncology. Um, and we're going to go through cardiothoracic imaging for the 2A. So I'm kind of basically going to dive straight into questions um, because ultimately that is the best way to learn for the exam. And I'll go through kind of briefly what I use um, and we'll take it from there. If there's anything that needs to be done afterwards as a separate session, then we can try and arrange that with the guys. So let me just share my screen. So can everyone see my screen, hopefully? OK, so great. OK, so in reality, um, you're never going to be able to cover all of cardiac and all of thoracic imaging in an hour and a half. Um, but we're going to try and go through the core stuff that people get confused about. So things like how to approach lung nodules in the exam, how to differentiate different types of peripheral consolidation, We'll touch on pulmonary fibrosis because you can actually spend a whole day doing pulmonary fibrosis, but just the core topics that tend to come up <clears throat> year on year. Mosaic attenuation, pulmonary hypertension, empyema versus abscess is a common theme because uh, it's important clinically. You manage them completely differently. So they like to test things like that. Um, CT guided lung biopsy is obviously very common uh, and it's a very high yield topic. So you need to be very aware of how to manage complications. Uh, then we'll go to cardiac. Uh, and then we'll look at constrictive and restrictive cardiomyopathies, patterns of LGE, coronary artery territories, chamber enlargements with different shunts, and coronary anomalies. <clears throat> so, right, don't panic, but over the course of a year, I touched upon these different books. So I'll give you my approach. It doesn't, won't work for everyone, but it might work for you. So I started by basically doing a topic on core radiology. So I do chest, I'd read core because core gives you a really good basic understanding of a topic. Um, and then I would dive into crack the core. So then I do chest and core radiology, look at the chest section and crack the core. And then I would just do questions for chest. And then I kind of done chest and I'm done with that. Different people work differently. My advice is not to just do questions because you'll realise when you do the exam, it's a balance. You, I've n there's no book, there's no question book that I have seen where when I came out of the exam said ah, that is that book was exactly the same. It doesn't happen. They assess concepts of knowledge in the 2A. So you do need an in-depth understanding. You can't get away with just doing questions. This is actually probably such a great resource. So Songs for FRCR was amazing. Uh, not only because you it's high yield stuff, it makes you feel better. So you're driving to work, we're on a commute, you do an hour of listening in the morning and do an hour of listening in the evening. On the days where you couldn't do any revision, you actually feel like, okay, well, at least I've listened to these lectures. Um, and then you feel like you've learned something. And ultimately, it's a marathon, this exam. You can't get away with doing a month's revision or two months revision or three months. It's a prolonged period of work, little and often. Obviously, you cram at the end like anyone does. You try and do as much as you can towards the end of the exam. But generally, you need to start early. Day night is the is the debated one, really. So in my opinion, day night is an amazing resource. Um, and I basically did questions. And I would then control F in day night to get the, um, the way it's described in day night. So the exam is all based on day night, really. So if they describe a chondroplasia, they're going to describe achondroplasia in the way Dana has described it. The problem with Dana is it's a very complex book. You can't read it. You can't just open Dana and just start flicking through it. It's impossible because it's all it's a it's not a user friendly book. But if you use it just as a reference guide, it's great. So you do UIP, then just control find UIP in Dana, read the things that have an exclamation mark next to it, which is the high yield topic. And then you're pretty good to go. In between Dana and the question and answers, you're pretty safe that you've covered enough for that specific uh, subject. All right, we can go through this in, at another time. I said to Jordan earlier, if worst comes to worst, we can arrange a 
Q&A at some point for general top tips about 2A or how to approach different types of questions, but I want to try and get through as much chest and cardiac as I can. So hopefully this will be interactive. So I think there should be questions that are going to pop up on the chat. So you can answer, it's all anonymous. You might as well give it a go. It doesn't matter if you get 0%, it's no one's checking. So 42 year old male, non-smoker presents with to respiratory outpatients with a prolonged history of cough. You look at the HRCT, there's ill-defined tiny ground glass nodules in both lungs with no zonal predominance. No nodules abutting the pleural edge or focal consolidation. No pleural or pericardial effusion, no constitutional symptoms. What's the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, RBILD? B, subacute HP, C, sarcoid, D, co-workers, pneumoconiosis, or E, infective bronchiolitis. I'll give you like a minute or so because we don't have that much time. For those guys who are typing, is that because your it's the questions aren't coming up on your polls or? OK, so there's a bit of a mixed bag, but the majority is going with B, which is the correct answer. So listen, every description in a question is there for a reason. They're not allowed. And you remember the exact each question is vetted by a couple of radiologists before it's approved to be put in uh, to the exam. So you're not allowed to mislead someone. So if you say non-smoker, the answer can therefore not be RBILD. That's the start. Prolonged history of cough with no constitutional symptoms. So if you look at the options, you've then eliminated E because you can't say someone's got an infection and then give a history of something that's indolent and your point, you can't point away from an infection in the body of the text and expect people to miraculously say, oh, well, infection is more common, so therefore it's more likely to be that. It doesn't work like that. If you've got something written in the body of the text that's pointing you away from a diagnosis, then that is not the right answer. Sarcoid. So this is the key here. So diffuse, ill-defined, tiny ground glass nodules, that could be anything. No zonal predominance, again, could be anything. But this is the key. No nodules abutting the pleural edge. Nodules that are blood abut the pleural edge are, by definition, perilymphatic. Sarcoid classically is perilymphatic. So you can, based on that, say this is therefore less likely to be sarcoid. And then you're left with B and D. Co-workers pneumoconiosis is exactly the same. Small calcified nodules, usually perilymphatic with calcified lymph nodes. So there's no doubt this is subacute HP. There's not there's not a debate. No one, there's no consultant who's going to look at this question and say, oh no, I think this is misleading. This is B. This is a question that is very classic for the exam. All right. Next question. So looks exactly the same, and I'll just run through this with you because it's easier. 42-year-old heavy smoker presents to respiratory outpatients with a prolonged history of cough. On review of the HRCT, they are all defined ground glass nodules in both lungs with an upper to mid zone predominance. No nodules are bust in the pleural edge or focal consolidation. No pleural or pericardial fusion, no constitutional symptoms. So now what's the answer? Remember, there's only one answer. I can't change this question and put heavy smoker and then expect anything other than a single answer which all of you are getting. And this is RBILD, OK? And this is this is how you need to answer a question. You need to look and think, OK, what have they told me that's relevant? OK, they've said he's a heavy smoker. So, OK, that's important. They're not just they're not just writing. It's not verbal rubbish just for the sake of it. Um, and then ill-defined ground glass nodules in both lungs. Again, massive differential. So then you're looking at things. How can I differentiate? OK, so I've got a heavy smoker. I've got an upper to mid zone predominance. So I'm already thinking, OK, this is a smoking related lung disease. There's only one smoking related lung disease in the body. OK, so let's crack on. I'm sure you've all seen this before. So just a quick summary. Summary. So when we talk about small or multiple lung nodules, we mean small nodules that are basically two to three millimetres in size that present in three distinct patterns. So you've either got perilymphatic, which is basically either going to be wrapped around the central lobular structures or 
going to be along the interlobular septum, which is the periphery of the um, secondary pulmonary lobule. So remember, the secondary pulmonary lobule is the functional unit of lung. They're usually like polygonal shape, two centimetres, um, and you've got a terminal bronchial. So when you think centrilobular nodules, you're thinking something airway centric most commonly. So something that's affecting the centrilobular airways. So you should be thinking before you click on anything that's centrilobular, you should be thinking, actually, is this an airway related disease or not? Because if it's not an airway related disease, then maybe this is not centrilobular. And then you've got perilymphatic nodules. So perilymphatic nodules, um, the most common ones you're going to come across are sarcoid, or pneumoconiosis or lymphangitis, and they're your top three differentials that you should hone in on and then try and exclude one of those three. And then you've got random. So random, the majority of nodules will be within the capillary bed and the capillary bed tends to be more central lobular rather than periphery, but you will also get nodules abutting the pleural edge or along the interlobular septum. So it's mixed. Um, it's a combination of both central lobular and perilymphatic. So again, you've got miliary TB, uh, miliary met, they're the common things, or miliary sarcoid, they're the ones that you're going to get tested on. They're not going to ask you obscure, uh, random things. So this is a quick example, just as a visual aid of what subacute HP would look like. So tiny, ill-defined ground glass nodules, and you can see no nodules abutting the pleural edge. Okay, you've got a black rim, and that's how you can be convinced. You can see even along the fissure, there's no nodules abutting the fissures. There's a clear black rim separating um, the central obvious structures from the perilymphatic. So this is a barn door central obvious nodule pattern. So this is either subacute HP or RBILD. This is RBILD. Um, so you can see they look, actually look really similar, uh, which is why you would never get asked to differentiate both unless they're giving you a smoking history. So just only try and think of other ways of differentiating. Smoking is the only way. This is a mem. You, I'm not going to go through this, but when you go through the presentation, if you want, then this is just a very simple but important way of looking at it. Central lobular nodules are either infection, inflammatory, or malignant, and that just needs to get in your head. If you're ever thinking about nodules, this is how you think about it, and that's it. Okay, so next question. So, a 57 year old male with a 20 pack year history presents with hemoptysis. He's reviewed by a respiratory who organised a CT thorax and abdomen. On review, there's an ill-defined right-sided perihyla mass invading the mediastinum with extrinsic compression of the right upper lobe bronchus and the right upper lobe pulmonary vein. There is smooth interlobular septal thickening in the right upper lobe. No long nodules, enlarged right hyla and right paratracheal lymph nodes. Which of the following is the most accurate diagnosis? Now, lung cancer is probably the only staging thing that they can ever ask in the exam. And even that is dubious. So I had a lung cancer question in my 2B. Um, I got asked to stage whether they would put it into the 2A. I don't write the questions, so I don't know. Um, but the fact that it's allowed to be tested in the 2B makes me think that it's reasonable fodder for exams for the 2A. And it's a very easy question um, in terms of lung cancer staging. It's one of the few that are actually relatively straightforward to learn. So this is probably going to cause debate. And that's what I put in. So the majority have said T3N1 with right upper lobe. OK, so if we go through the question, so smoker, respiratory, or that's all just generic info. Then you get to the nitty gritty and you say, okay, so what is, what's going on? So you've got ill-defined perihyla mass. That doesn't help you with TNM, invading the mediastinum, okay? So that's your T4. You've got a T4 tumour, so your answers are either A or C. With extrinsic compression of the right upper lobe bronchus, doesn't really help with your staging, you're already at T4, and the right upper lobe pulmonary vein. Smooth interlobular septal thickening in the right upper lobe. So this is probably not fair question, but what I'm trying to get across to you is that not everything that's interlobular septal thickening in the context of cancer is lymphangitis. So if this sentence wasn't mentioned, the right extrinsic compression of the right upper lobe pulmonary vein, then I would agree 
this is most likely going to represent lymphangitis. But if they're telling you that actually there's a tumour that's compressing the right upper lobe pulmonary vein, that means you've got delayed venous return from the right upper lobe. And you know what delayed pulmonary venous return is? That's basically localised heart failure. Um, and remember, your pulmonary veins are in the periphery of your interlobular septum, um, which results in interlobular septal thickening. So this is a question that will separate whether you understand a, what the pulmonary vein actually does, what infangitis actually is, and how you can differentiate. And this is how you differentiate. If you, someone's written that there's extrinsic compression of the right upper lower pulmonary vein, then the answer is going to be something to do with pulmonary edema. You're not allowed to write that and then say, actually, it's infangitis. No, that's just not allowed. So everything in the question is relevant. And that's honestly like the key with all these. The 2A is um, it's exam technique as well as knowledge, but a lot of it is exam technique and understanding what is someone telling me? Why are they writing that? There's a reason. There has to be a reason. You can't just write random things. And then with regards to nodal staging, just remember if it's on the unilateral hilum, it's N1. If it's if it's paratracheal on the same side, then it's N2. If it's contralateral hilum, then it's N3. Um, and if it's supraclavicular either way, then it's also N3. So this is what lymphangitis looks like as opposed to pulmonary edema. So you can see really it's irregular nodular interlobular septal thickening, usually with um, nodules associated. You can see this irregular nodularity um, so you've basically got a perilymphatic pattern of nodularity that's predominantly affecting the subpleura and the interlobular septum. And this is a common thing that people want to look at. It's how do you differentiate sarcoid and co-workers pneumoconiosis from lymphangitis? Because both are technically a perilymphatic pattern. And the difference comes because sarcoid is a predominant nodular pattern of disease. So if you had a question that said, OK, so how do you differentiate sarcoid from lymphangitis? Then you're looking at, OK, well, sarcoid is a nod predominantly nodular pattern of disease. So you get lots of nodules abutting the bronchovascular bundle just like this. So you can see it thickening and irregular nodularity along the peri-bronchovascular bundles and reaching the, the uh, subpleural interstitium. But there's less of a burden of interlobular septum thickening. Whereas in lymphangitis, which is this one, you've got predominance of asymmetrical septal thickening and less nodules. So that's a differentiator and that's the type of stuff that the 2A is all about. It's how do you, you're always left with two and you need to know how to differentiate two common things that look relatively similar but there will be a key difference. So again, I'm not going to dwell on it but these are your main differentials for perilymphatic nodules. You're unlikely to get thing, asked things for perilymphatic that's outside of these three. So knowing how to differentiate it, like we've said, nodules versus septal thickening is important. OK, 52 year old female is being reviewed at respiratory outpatients. She has a new diagnosis of adult onset asthma with recurrent episodes of chest tightness and cough. She has had two CT thorax scans within the last six months showing non resolving peripheral patches of consolidation with scattered central lobular nodules, no pleurofusions. Blood work is unremarkable other than having a raised eosinophil and a positive titer for anchor. What is the most likely diagnosis? And just remember, before you answer, just look at the question, read what's written and think, why have I written adult onset asthma, anchor positive with peripheral consolidation? There's only one diagnosis that gives you all three. Some will give you some and some will give you others, but there's only one diagnosis that gives you all of those. So the majority of the split is between C and D, which is kind of what I expected was going to happen. So the, those of you who have said D, I suspect it's because you've seen peripheral consolidation and anchor antibodies, and you'd be absolutely correct. But the answer is C. So eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis is Churg Strauss. So remember the diagnostic criteria for Churg Strauss is adult onset asthma, peripheral consolidation, and 75% have anchor positive. So there's only one diagnosis that is the most likely based on 
everything that's written in the, all the information that's provided. If it didn't say add or on set asthma, this wouldn't be a question because you can't then differentiate between chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, Chuck Strauss, or gynecomatosis, uh, polyangiitis or Wegener's is what most people used to call it. So let's just go through each one. So chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, you're going to get a bilateral, non-segmental areas of consolidation um, that's usually very periphery and it gives you this reverse bat wing morphology. Um, it's usually upper to mid zone um, and you have to have raised eosinophils, either IgE uh, or it will tell you from a bronch that they've got raised eosinophils. If it didn't say anchor positive and it didn't say adult onset asthma, then this will be a more likely diagnosis because it's more common. Um, and one differentiator between Churg Strauss and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia is nodules. So nodules are much less common with eosinophilic pneumonia and much more common with Churg Strauss. So again, this question is basically telling you adult onset asthma, peripheral consolidation and anchor. One diagnosis, eosinophilic granulomatosis. So what would chronic organising pneumonia show? So I think some of you, how many? OK, no one said that, which is great. It's not the right answer. So you'd have to get a good history for it. So you want chronic cough, chronic dyspnea, recurrent treatments with antibiotics that are non-resolving, um, and then they're going to give you specific patterns. So chronic is in a, um, chronic uh, cryptogenic organising pneumonia is, the classic is these linear band-like opacities that are parallel to the pleural edge. Um, or they're going to give you a reverse halo sign. So they're going to say there's a focal area of consolidation with a peripheral rim. Um, and they have to make it clear. OK, they can't give you peripheral consolidation, band-like capacities, adult onset asthma and mix multiple pathologies together. There's going to be one unifying diagnosis only. Wegener's, or D, you'd be looking at waxing and waning pulmonary nodules tend to be cavitating. So most common presentation is with cavitation, um, but they can also present with subpleural consolidation um, and usually bronchovascular consolidation or pulmonary hemorrhage. So it's the pulmonary hemorrhage in Wegener's that is, gives you the peripheral patches of consolidation. Um, but they have to give you something. To make that the answer, they need to tell you something else. So they can say anchor, that's fair. And they can tell you that there's non-resolving consolidation despite antibiotics. That's also fair. But they need to say, like, there's some renal problems or there's nasal septal abnormalities. They need to push you to have vasculitis because otherwise you can't resolve any of these peripheral consolidations based on that history. So you need to look for the secondary signs. So let's just go through again. Chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, peripheral consolidation, reverse bat wing, no nodules, upper to mid zone predominance, cryptogenic organising pneumonia, lower zone predominant, bands like capacities and a reverse halo. Churg Strauss is this non-resolving consolidation, tends to be segmental rather than non-segmental and tends to have nodules and would be associated with adult onset asthma. Wegener's or granulomatosis with polyangitis, peripheral consolidation or subpleural consolidation or bronchovascular consolidation will anchor but would have to give you something else. It has to say cavitating lung nodules, non-resolving lung nodules, something else, um, multi-system, renal, like glomerulonephritis, nasal septal damage. It has to give you something else. Primary edema, no one said because it doesn't sound like that. And that gives you a bat wing, perihylar consolidation. So again, I'll just keep this on for two seconds, just so if you watch the video again, you can look back at it. But this is basically everything we've discussed. So you can have a brief look. So this is a good case that I saw online from Radiology Assistant. That's basically, this is an example of um, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. So you've got areas of peripheral consolidation, these areas, you can see these are non, these look quite segmental, but these are very non-segmental, confluent peripheral consolidation, um, no nodules. This has a wide differential, OK? And like we said before, the only way to differentiate it in a question is with the other factors. And this is what chronic eosinophilic, um, this is what cryptogenic organising pneumonia looks like. So you've got these um, band-like capacities, 
You can see them here in the Sagittal. tool. They're parallel to the pleura. And then you've got this characteristic finding, which is called perilobular consolidation or perilobular fibrosis. And you can see this is a secondary pulmonary nodule, right? It looks like a square. And you've got consolidation that's outlining it. So this is called perilobular consolidation. So if you ever see perilobular consolidation, um, your diagnosis is going to be cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Okay, and remember, chronic consolidation, non-resolving, no eosinophils, no other features of vasculitis. Okay, there are many things that they don't have. So no eosinophils, no other features of vasculitis with a chronic consolidation that's periphery, that tends to be a lower zone, that has band-like capacities, um, can be fibrotic or can be non-fibrotic. So here you can see distracted airways. So this tends to mean this will be fibrotic um, um, organised pneumonia, but that's fine. The limit to what you're going to be asked is just to differentiate the different types of pump peripheral consolidation. I think we've kind of covered that enough. So again, from Radiology Assistant, which is a, the best website, but you can see it's beautiful. This is all the examples of what, the, what it gives you. Peripheral consolidation, band-like capacities, perilobular consolidation and the reverse halo. So, 72 year old female with chronic history of rheumatoid arthritis presents with progressive shortness of breath and a dry cough. She's reviewed after HRCT, which demonstrates evidence of a fibrotic lung disease. What's the most likely pattern of fibrosis that is associated with her underlying condition? I'll give you a minute to just get your answers in. Okay, so as I expected, it's a good mix between A and B. It seems like B is probably the majority, so that's fine. So the answer is actually A. So most connective tissue diseases are NSIP, but rheumatoid, the classic is UIP. And this unfortunately is the definition of the two A exam. The mo it will ask you a specific part of a curriculum that you might not have specifically read about. So you will have read in your books and your questions that the most common pattern of fibrosis associated with um, connective tissue diseases um, like systemic sclerosis or Sjogren's or scleroderma is NSIP. And then there'll be one sentence that says rheumatoid arthritis is most commonly with UIP. And that's the, the outsider. And unfortunately, the outsider is what they like to ask for because that kind of shows that you've read outside of the topic. So this is UIP. Um, now, how do we differentiate UIP? So we can do the next question and then we'll talk about it. So which of the following suggests an alternative diagnosis to UIP? Is it A, subpleural and basal predominant fibrosis? Is it B, honeycombing? Is it C, subpleural reticulation? Is it D, peribronchial disease? Or is it E, architectural distortion? So remember, read the question. Which of the following suggests an alternative diagnosis? Not classical, alternative. So I think the majority of you have got it right, and some of you have probably got caught out with the wording of the question. So just remember, the wording of the question clearly says alternative diagnosis to UIP, um, rather than what's the most classical diagnosis for UIP? So if it said classical, then I agree. I would probably say, well then, if it said classical, you'd probably say all of them. Then you have to think, actually, how can this question be, oh, how can this question be telling me um, what's the most classical diagnosis and all of these are the same? These are pretty all synonymous. So you have to look back at the question and say, okay, so it's also an alternative diagnosis. So the peribronchial disease. So what is UIP? So UIP generally um, is a pattern of fibrosis that is basal predominant reticulations with honeycombing. Ground glass change can be present but should not be the predominant finding. 
but you shouldn't be having cysts, central lobular or perilymphatic nodules. That points, that points you to an alternative diagnosis to UIP. What does NSIP show? So NSI, NSIP will show basal predominant, so they're the same in terms of distribution, but predominantly ground glass changes. Um, and you can have two types, is either the cellular type or the fibrotic type. And the cellular type is ground glass change that's persistent and is basal predominant and doesn't resolve. And you can also have dependent ground glass changes associated with fibrosis. So you can have architectural distortion and bronchiectasis. Um, and that's how you differentiate cellular NSIP from fibrotic NSIP. It's just based on the presence of bronchiectasis and architectural distortion. Peribronchial disease should make you think of chronic HP. Um, so peribronchial disease basically means consolidation that's kind of focused around the bronchovascular bundles rather than periphery or basally. Um, and what you get with chronic HP is peribronchial fibrosis with ground glass change and mosaic attenuation. And you tend to get this head cheese pattern, which is basically a balance between ground glass change, that's one, normal lung, which is in between, and lucent lung because of air trapping. So if you ever see a question that says, there are three types of lung density, one is lucent, one is seems normal, and one is ground glass, then your answer is chronic HP. But they can't ask that without saying that. Um, don't forget there are multiple patterns, uh, phases of HP. There's acute, subacute, and chronic. This is, we're talking about chronic HP here. Uh, subacute HP does not tend to present with fibrosis, tends to present with what we saw earlier, just diffuse central lobular ground glass nodules. So just going back, so let's just see this. So let's just go through why the other ones weren't correct. So what would organising pneumonia show? I'm not going to go through that again because we've literally just gone through that. Um, but LIP, so LIP tends to show, remember what it stands for, lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. So you're going to tend to get perilymphatic distribution of things. So perilymphatic distribution of lung cysts. So they're usually perivascular. So remember, there's two types of lymphatics. They're either peribronchovascular. Because remember, you've got the lymphatics that wrap around the bronchovascular bundle, or you've got around the subpleura. Um, so there's that's so that's your lymphatic um, times. on a background of ground glass change. So ground glass change, interlobular septal thickening, with lung cysts, think LIP, and there has to be a history, usually Sjogren's, um, in, or background of HIV. HIV tends to be associated with childhood um, LIP. So just briefly, this is what um, the difference between NSIP and UIP would look like. So you can see on the top slide you've got a predominant ground glass change with airways distraction. So this is going to probably be a likely fibrotic or early fibrotic NSIP in comparison to the bottom slide where you've got honeycombing, interlobular and intralobular septal thickening with architectural distortion, both basal predominant, so that doesn't differentiate, but what differentiates is the ground glass change burden. Much higher ground glass change burden in NSIP compared to UIP. Okay, so next question. So you're asked to give your opinion on an on-table HRCT. On the inspiratory scan, there's a patchwork of both low and high attenuation regions in both lungs. The vessels in the lower attenuation regions of the lungs are relatively small in calibre. Post expiration, the regions of low attenuation in both lungs remain unchanged. What's the next most appropriate investigation? So you've got prone HRCT, CTPA, CT thorax with contrast, repeat CT in three months, or lung function tests. So we've got a big split between A, B and E, but the majority seems to be with E, which is great. So the answer is E. 
this is this is exam fodder this mosaic attenuation understanding how to differentiate it's an easy question and there's only ever one answer no debate so let's just go through it so on the inspiratory scan there's a patchwork of both low and high attenuation fine so that just means there's mosaic attenuation it's not telling you which bits are abnormal whenever you have mosaic attenuation the next thing you look at is the vessels you ask yourself is the vessel in the lucent lung or the lower attenuation lung the same as the vessel size in the apparent ground glass lung if the answer is no and the vessels in the lower attenuation lung are smaller then your answer is that the lucent lung is abnormal now at that point you then have two options so let's just go down our flow charts we've got mosaic attenuation we looked at the vessel caliber we see that in the lucent lung they're smaller in caliber compared to the ground glass lung so we know that we're down this part of the front of the flow chart so we've got small caliber so we're looking at perfusional abnormalities perfusional abnormalities are either going to be air trapping or they're going to be because of vascular disease the only way to differentiate those two on imaging is an expiratory ct so if you were to do an expiratory ct you would then realize so this is an example maybe if it's visual it'd be easier to understand so you've got very subtle mosaic attenuation so you can see for example these areas of lung the vessels are relatively absent compared to the for example the periphery which is probably the less good example let's compare the difference between so you can see so let's take this segment here so you've got a segmental area of lucent lung compared to relatively ground glass probably not the best example it's not projecting very well but if you look at the post expiratory scan you can see that, that area of lung that was relatively lucent is still lucent so this is the abnormal lung that is, has air trapped in it so when you expire you expect your density of lung to become more dense because there's nothing in it so remember air is less dense than lung parenchyma so you can see this is all collapsed lung parenchyma which is actually normal this is the abnormal lung that is relatively radiolucent um, and it's it's got air trapping in it because it's not managing to expire the air does that make sense type in this topic if you don't get it because this is an important topic and this tends type of topic tends to come up a lot year on year because it's such a it's an important part of chest imaging so I'll just go through it again. So you've got mosaic attenuation. You look at the vessel caliber in terms of the question. It will tell you, it has to tell you. You then decide if it says the vessel calibers are the same in both the low attenuation and the high attenuation lung, you've got ground glass change. So then you go down your route of diffuse airspace changes. Is it infection? Is it pulmonary edema? Um, is it PCP infection? Okay, anything that gives you diffuse ground glass change. If it says in the question, the vessels are small in the lucent lung you've only got two options you either got air trapping or you've got vascular disease and if we go back to our question it says that the vessels in the lower attenuation regions of the lungs are small so we are here so we're here so we're going to either have air trapping or we're going to have vascular disease so then we go back to the question and we say okay post expiration the low attenuation lungs areas remain unchanged so that means that post expiration those segments could not get rid of the air they got trapped so this is air trapping and the only thing that would assess someone's airways is lung function tests fine that's not a job of a radiologist to decide but we know that out of the other imaging tests it doesn't make sense if the question had said post expiration the regions of low attenuation in both lungs increased or became relatively dense then the answer would be ctpa because that implies that you've got abnormal lucent lung on inspiration but it appropriately expires but you've got a small vessel caliber so you're going to go down to down the flow chart to vascular disease so you'll be looking at ctpa hopefully that makes sense the other way to differentiate vascular disease from um, 
air trapping is the pattern of, 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 of lucency in the lung. So this is an example of chrono, chronic thromboembolic disease on the left. And on the right, you've got air trapping. So you can see in chronic thromboembolic disease, the amount of lucency or mosaic attenuation is, tends to be very peripheral and very large areas. Whereas in air trapping, they're usually lobular or segmental. So if the question says lobular areas of lucency with small vessel caliber, then it's more likely to be air trapping. If it says large areas of peripheral relative lucency, then it's more likely to be a vascular problem. But they're not going to be that out of order. They have to give you more info. So, for example, they will say there's background of airway disease, or he's a smoker, or there's bronchial wall thickening, or there's mucus plugging. So that's pushing you down the air trapping group. Or if they're going to push you down the vascular core, they'll say there was primary trunk was dilated at 36 millimetres and there is mosaic attenuation. So you have to then link them together and say, OK, dilated primary trunk, mosaic attenuation, chronic PE. <clears throat> All right, next question. So a 62 year old female presents with worsening shortness of breath on minimal exertion and is being discussed in the primary hypertension MDT. The clinician mentions that the pulmonary artery pressure is 45 with a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of 30. The imaging is not available at the time of discussion. Based on the information provided, what's the most likely cause of the patient's pulmonary hypertension? Now, this is a bit of a mean question, but I just want to get a crucial point to you that's very easy to um, have in the bag. The question hasn't come up, but that's fine. I don't know if that's just my phone, but I'll just go through it with you. Or you can type what you think the answer is, if it's easier. And don't worry if you're wrong, because this is a hard question. And I know you're not clinicians and neither am I, but this is a primary hypertension is very much radiology led in terms of imaging. Um, so I think it's an important high yield topic that you should be aware of. And this will be a simple way of for you to answer any questions in the future. Pulmonary artery pressure over 15 or 20 is abnormal, fine. So this guy's got pulmonary hypertension. You already know that um, because it's telling you he's in the pulmonary hypertension MDT. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of 30. So what does that mean? That means that the, when they put an invasive cath, so they put a wire into the right atrium and they were trying to get FDHL pressures, it's raised. There's only one real topic, uh, abnormality here that causes raised um, pulmonary capillary wedge pressures and that's left heart failure. So this is what you need to know. So if they say pulmonary hypertension with an increased mean pulmonary artery pressure, they're going to give you the, the pulmonary the capillary wedge pressure. If the capillary wedge pressure is greater than 15, there is only one answer. And that one answer is left heart disease. If it's less than 15, then they need to give you more information. They need to give you a lung CT and say there is normal lung parenchyma and the patient is young and there is no mediastinal lymph nodes. OK, but the chances are that's more complicated. It's much easier to give you a question and say primary artery pressure is raised and the capillary wedge pressure is raised because then there is no doubt. There's one diagnosis and there's going to be no debate. So that's how you need to think. That's how people write questions. They don't want to confuse and have a debate or their question withdrawn. So there's going to be a clear answer. And if I was writing a question, that's exactly how I'd write it. I'd say raise pulmonary artery pressure, increase capillary wedge pressure, because I know there's only one diagnosis now. No one can say, oh, I debate that question. It doesn't make sense. That's not fair. It, this is a barn door answer. You either know it or you don't. So 28 year old female presents with worsening shortness of breath or minimal exertion. It's being discussed in primary hypertension MDT. Her initial echo shows a normal size LA and LV with preserved EF. Right atrium and right ventricle are dilated with high probability for primary hypertension. She has a CTPA as part of her workup, which demonstrates a dilated primary trunk measuring 36 millimeters. No evidence of acute or chronic PE multiple enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes and evidence of interlobular septal thickening within the lung parenchyma. What's the most likely cause for the patient's pulmonary hypertension? So do you want to have a look? If there's no questions in the chat box, then just uh, type it.
So chronic lung disease. So this is a difficult question, but again, what makes you think it's chronic lung disease? So worsening shortness of breath, minimal exertion is being discussed. So this is just pulmonary hypertension. OK, that's how they present shortness of breath. Her record shows a normal sized left atrium. So remember, dilated left atrium, think left heart failure. OK, so normal left atrium, so we know it's not left heart failure. Right atrium and right ventricle are dilated with probability of pulmonary hypertension. So again, everything we've been told so far is just saying that the patient has pulmonary hypertension. She has a CTPA, which shows a dilated pulmonary trunk. So again, this is just pulmonary hypertension. We have not gone any closer to the diagnosis. No evidence of acute or chronic PE. Fine. So the answer is not chronic PE. So we know that. Multiple enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes and interlobular septal thickening. So this is pathognomonic. If you get a patient in the exam where they say young patient with pulmonary hypertension and mediastinal lymph nodes and interlobular septal thickening plus minus ground glass change, there is only one answer, and it is veno-occlusive disease. This is important. And so idiopathic pulmonary artery, um, hypertension would not give you enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes commonly and doesn't give you interlobular septal thickening. Diastolic dysfunction means that the left ventricle doesn't relax properly. So when the left ventricle doesn't relax properly, the left atrium gets big. So remember, when we see left atrial enlargement, we're going to think left-sided heart failure or diastolic dysfunction. So they're synonymous, right? So the answer is not C. Chronic lung disease, they've given us a CTPA where they haven't mentioned that there's fibrotic lungs. So we can't say that it's D. They would never expect you to say D is the right answer because there's nothing in the history that says that there is a chronic lung disease. An intracardiac shunt, it's possible, but intracardiac shunts wouldn't give you multiple and large lymph nodes. Um, and remember, it's a left to right shunt. So you're not necessarily going to get interlobular septal thickening. You're not getting back pressure. OK, so this is important. Pulmonary hypertension, mediastinal lymph nodes with septal thickening, pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. Young patient with pulmonary hypertension that doesn't mention anything else and says everything else is normal, that is when it's idiopathic. Idiopathic is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, when they basically discounted everything else. Pulmonary hypertension with a dilated left atrium. Think left sided heart failure. Pulmonary hypertension with a increased capillary wedge pressure of greater than 15. There is only one diagnosis and that is left sided heart failure. Is that clear? It's an important topic. In the interest of time, let's skip that one. You can, I'll keep the question open and you can have a look, but let's just, and I'll leave the answer open. And you can always pause it to look. So 82 year old retired stonemason was admitted with a chronic cough and sputum production for 12 months. Pulmonary function test showed an obstructive lung defect with normal lung volumes. Laboratory and physical examination was normal. Chest CT showed an irregularly marginated nodule in the right upper lobe with contiguous nodularity and thickening along the bronchovascular bundle. This had increased in size from 20 to 30 millimeters when compared to the previous CT three months prior. There is evidence of fissural retraction and multiple microcalcifications. There are other perilymphatic micronodules bilaterally. In the media sign, a note is made of small volume calcified lymph nodes. Which of the following investigations would be most useful to try and differentiate whether this nodule is a lung cancer or progressive massive fibrosis? Is it a triple phase CT? Is it an MRI with T2? Is it subtraction imaging? Is it a dose tape PET CT or is it a contrast ultrasound? I'll give you a minute. My phone is not refreshing to let me see the chat. So. Oh, it's come up now. So 
So for the people who said Dota take pets, if anyone is brave enough, can you just type as to why you think it's Dota take pet? What made you think that? The answer is B, and I'll tell you why. In the meantime, someone wants to type this up to them. If not, then I'll explain why anyway. So this is, there's, th there is a differential, right? So the answer, this is patient has been described. So this is what the 2A is actually really like. You read a question, you think, yes, I know the answer is going to be pneumoconiosis. Then the question never actually asks you what the diagnosis is. It then tells you the diagnosis and asks you for something else. And it's the most frustrating part of the exam, but it's unfortunately common. Um, you're reading it and you think, OK, this guy's got pneumoconiosis, he's got PMF. So that's it, I'm going to where's PMF? And then you look at the question and it's asking something completely different. That is very frustrating. But that's the nature of the exam. So you have to kind of get used to it, which is why I put these questions in, because this is realistic. So which of the following investigations would be most useful to try and differentiate whether this is a lung cancer or PMF? So triple phase CT thorax? No. We don't do that to differentiate lung cancers from anything, really. Um, MRI, let's ignore for a sec. Subtraction imaging? I mean, that's just, I, that's not a thing um, for looking at lung nodules. We don't do subtraction imaging. It's not really going to help. Dota take PET CT is to look for neuroendocrine things usually. So that's not going to help in this situation. Remember, it's FDG PET that you look for in lung cancer, not Dota take PET. OK, and that's a crucial thing that you need to understand. FDG PET CT is what we look for to differentiate or to, die, to, to help in the diagnostic pathway of lung cancers. Dota take PET CT tends to be for neuroendocrine stuff. Contrast ultrasound, you're not going to be able to ultrasound the lung, right? It's just going to get reflectivity straight away. So I would argue that even if PET CT was an option and it said FDG PET, just remember that FDG PET is just showing you active inflammation. It's a glucose analogue and glucose goes anywhere where they're in active inflammation. So you've got a patient who's got a growing lung nodule. If that's PMF, then it's active PMF. And if it's lung cancer, then it's an active lung cancer. So FDG PET anyway wouldn't help. T2 weighted imaging on MRI is helpful because fibrosis is low on T2 or more commonly low on T2, whereas lung cancers tend to be intermediate towards high. Most often they're higher on T2, whereas fibrosis is lower on T2. So to differentiate lung cancer, from PMF, in reality, it's a biopsy, but for the sake of the exam, it's an MRI with T2 weighted imaging. If MRI wasn't there, then I would say out of those options, the answer would be FDG PET, not Dota Tape PET. So Dota PET is never right in this situation. It's FDG PET, if anything. But like I said, active fibrosis is avid on PET and therefore is not really reliable, whereas MRI with T2 weighted imaging is more reliable. So empyema versus abscess, a common exam question where you'll be left with one that will just give you a description of an, a cavity-like abnormality in the right lung, and it will explain to you what it's doing to these things. So it's, it's not going to say there is a split pleura, because then 100% of you will get it right. It's going to say what it does to the bronchovascular bundles. Remember, a lung abscess is an intrinsic lung abnormality. So if something's in the lung and you've got a vessel, it's going to hit it and it's going to abruptly terminate. So if it says that there's a big cavity in the lung and the bronchovascular abuts it and it was an abrupt end to the bronchovascular bundle, then you're looking at a lung abscess. If it says that this abnormality in the lung, it seems to deviate the bronchovascular structures or push it away, then you're thinking, OK, this is more likely to be an empyema. Things like air doesn't help because you can get an air in an empyema and you can get an air in an abscess. So it doesn't really make a big difference. Um, the, an empyema is a split pleura. Fine. If it gives you that, then you're having a great day. They probably won't. But the difference is in terms of the wall is that the empyema wall is usually smooth and regular and thickened. 
Whereas in a lung abscess, it's irregular, it's thickened, it's corrugated. It's going to give you something. They have to give you one of them. It either has to say smooth walls with distortion of the bronchovascular bundle, or it has to say irregular thickened walls with abrupt termination of the bronchovascular bundles. And they're the two common differentiators. The bronchovascular, where does the bronchovascular bundle, and what the walls look like. If you're lucky, they will talk about the um, inflammation in the extrapural fat. Um, and you'll be looking at things like empyemol because it's part of the pleura, it's going to be inflammatory to the extrapural fat, but that's not as reliable as the other two. And remember, the management is different. So empyema, you would drain, whereas a lung abscess, you would treat with IV antibiotics. You don't tend to drain a lung abscess acutely because you increase the risk of a bronchopleural fistula. So that's why these questions are important. So a 62-year-old patient undergoes a CT-guided lung biopsy of a suspicious right upper lobe mass. The procedure is completed as planned with a small biopsy in pneumothorax. After approximately two minutes, the patient complains of a headache and collapses with a general tonic-clonic seizure. What would you do next? Do nothing and await resuscitation. Position the patient in the left lateral decubitus with high flow oxygen. Position the patient head down with high flow oxygen. Give buccal midazolam or do a chest strain for light detention. Just seeing if I can see anything, if I can see the poll. So the majority of you have said B, which is great. I would never have got this in the exam at the time. Obviously now I would, but back then, so that's great. So this is B. So this is an example of an air embolism, rare, but often can be a fatal complication. Um, so it's really important you know how to manage it. And they life stuff like this, because this is, remember this is an interventional procedure. It's very common for interventional, radi um, interventional radiology or chest radiologist to do this. So this is part of our curriculum and we should know how to manage complications. Um, so a classic example, headache, seizure, left lateral decubitus position. And the idea is that you're trying to trap the air in the right side of the heart. You don't want it to go into the systemic system because once it goes into the systemic system, you're finished. Um, so you're basically trapping it in the right ventricular outflow tract. So that's the correct answer. So well done. So pneumothorax, most common complication, air embolism, least common, but most severe. OK, and if they ask, it's 0.2%. And this is good for you to be aware of. These are the risk factors which could easily be written as a question. Which of the following is not a risk factor for an increased risk of pneumothorax? So the ones that are COPD, small lesion, long needle part, and a repeated pleural puncture. So these are the four common things that increase your risk for pneumothorax. So this could easily, you can just think, this could easily be written as a question, and therefore I need to make sure I learn this. Okay. So slightly more complicated, either you know it or you don't. So 32-year-old pregnant lady attends her appointment for a VQ to investigate a possible PE. The report conclusion is as follows. There is no matched or unmatched defects. Bilateral renal excretion noted. The worst conclusion ever. What is the most likely diagnosis? Left to right shunt, right to left shunt, normal study, suboptimal study, or positive study for PE. I'm just going to check my phone, see if this. I have to keep refreshing my phone to get the poll. Very frustrating. So I'll give you a minute to answer. And this is an, an art mini. And ultimately, if you've worked in nuclear medicine, or you've had a rotation and you've done VQ scans, you will know that this is not normal. But I can understand why a majority of you would say it's probably normal. But that's why I wanted to do this lecture, because anyone can read the common things that come up from textbooks, but this is the type of stuff that the exams are usually based upon because it's abstract knowledge that's important. So I think 
and we'll leave it at that. So that's C is the majority. The answer is actually B. So remember, when you inject perfusion or imaging, so when you're doing VQ scans, you're doing a inhalation for the ventilation and you're doing perfusion um, where you're injecting through the venous system. So when you get to the venous system, the idea is that this perfusion or agent, technetium, will get blocked at the level of the pulmonary artery, the small little arteries, and it will give you a perfusional map. That shouldn't make its way into the systemic circulation. So it stops at the level of the pulmonary artery. Is that clear? So when you do a VQ scan, you just get lung perfusion and lung ventilation. You don't get anything else. If you see systemic uptake, so you start to see uptake in the thyroid, or you see it in the kidney, or you see it in the brain, then that means you've got a shunt. And remember, you've injected from the vein, so you're in the pulmonary artery. So you've got a shunt that's moved from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. All right. So that's not going to be a Eisenmenger's, that's going to be like a pulmonary AVM, maybe a large pulmonary AVM, which has resulted in a right to left shunt. This is an art mini, you need to know this. Um, there's no other answer to these questions. So. VQ scan is only lung findings. You shouldn't be seeing systemic uptake. If you see systemic uptake, then you have to think that there's a right to left shunt, and the answer is a right to left shunt. Okay? Do you want to have a, you guys happy to continue, or do you want to have a two minute break? It's up to you. Or Jordan can tell me what to do. He's my boss today. It's a lot of information, so continue. Yeah, I think continue. Okay. okay. So next question. We're going to dive straight into cardiac. Oh, oh no. Um, 82 year old male with a recent diagnosis of multiple myeloma presents to cardiology outpatients with worsening shortness of breath and peripheral edema. His echo shows severe biatrial dilatation. LV is normal in size with concentric LVH and preserved ejection fraction. His myocardium is noted to have a speckled appearance on echo. The patient undergoes a cardiac MRI with the radiographer mentioning that there was a difficulty in nulling the myocardium during the TI scout. Based on the most likely diagnosis, which of the following is the least likely to be seen on the cardiac MRI? Diffuse subendocardial enhancement, diffuse subepicardial enhancement, dilated IVC in hepatic veins, reduced global longitudinal strain, or a normal thickness of pericardium. So let's just give it a minute. So the majority of you are saying B, which is lovely. So the answer is B, so it's good. So what's the diagnosis? Does anyone want to write it in the chat? Again, remember, you read this question, you think, oh, I know the diagnosis, and then the question will say, based on what you already know, what's, what is it, or what's they're likely to show? Which is why, this is why I say that you can't just do questions only. You need to, to, to answer this question, you need to have read around a topic. You'll never be able to answer this question unless you know the diagnosis and around the topic. Okay, so this is um, exactly. So this is amyloid. So this is cardiac amyloid. So cardiac amyloid, the pathognomonic and most sensitive. So again, if you get asked a question about the most sensitive imaging finding, it is that difficulty in nulling the myocardium during the TI scan. That's almost a hundred percent sensitive for cardiac amyloid. So that's one important point to mention. You could easily get asked which of the following is the most pathognomonic for cardiac amyloid, and that is the answer. It's difficulty in nulling. The pattern that you get is diffuse subendocardial enhancement. 
So therefore, if that is correct, then B is, if you knew that A was correct, you now know that the answer is B, right? And that's how you should think about it. You've got two options that are very, that are basically the opposite. So one, if one of them is right, then the other one is obviously wrong. Dilated, dilated IVC and hepatic veins. So remember, a, re a restrictive cardiomyopathy means that it doesn't fill properly. So if the left and right atrium don't fill properly, everything backflows. So you get in the left atrium, everything backflows to the lungs, so you get pulmonary edema. In the right atrium, everything backflows into the well, SVC, IVC, hepatic veins. So that's correct. So we expect that. Reduced global longitudinal strain basically means that the because it's restricted and it's a rigid heart, it's not contracting as well. So it might maintain ejection fraction, but it doesn't contract as well as it should. And a normal thickness pericardium. We expect to see a normal thickness pericardium because this is a restrictive cardiomyopathy, not a constrictive one. And we'll follow down to this question and then I'll explain the differences. So 63-year-old female presents a cardiology outpatients with progressive shortness of breath. On examination, her JVP is raised with shifting dullness in the abdomen and peripheral edema. Her echo shows a restricted filling of both ventricles and mild biatrial dilatation. There is a septal bounce which is accentuated with inspiration. The pericardium is prominent with increased echogenicity seen anterior to the RV free wall. LVEF is 58% and RVEF is 61%. There are small bilateral pleural effusions, but no pericardial effusion. What is the most likely diagnosis? So we've got six responses so far. Give it 30 seconds. Hmm. Okay, so the majority are saying B, and the majority are correct. So to those of you who have said D, I think one of you, that's fine, not unreasonable. The only thing I'd say is that, again, read the history. So presents to outpatients, it's possible, but very unlikely that someone's just going to be sitting at home with acute pericarditis. And by definition, if it's acute, they have to tell you it's acute. They've presented immediately to any with progressive shortness of breath. So the history doesn't sound like pericarditis. So this cannot be acute pericarditis. Pleural effu uh, pericardial effusion is a common manifestation. It's actually usually the most common imaging manifestation of pericarditis. We don't often see pericardial inflammation on imaging, but we do see the secondary signs, which is an effusion. So that's why D is not correct. A, so I thought that there would be a debate between A and B, but it seems like most of you already understand the concept, um, but I'll briefly go through it. So restrictive and constrictive can present in the same way. So they can both present with shortness of breath and they can both present with signs of right and left heart failure. And they can both present and they both do present with restricted filling of the ventricles and biatrial dilatation. So how do you differentiate on imaging? So one, restrictive cardiomyopathy, you would expect to see severe biatrial dilatation. In constrictive, it's usually mild. Septal bounce is almost pathognomonic for constrictive pericarditis or constrictive cardiomyopathy. And basically what that's saying is, is that because your heart chamber is like a rigid, um, because of the thickened pericardium, it doesn't allow your ventricles to expand and contract as normal. It becomes like one fixed volume. Um, so basically when you take a deep breath in, you get pulmonary venous return you'd normally get in reduced um, intrathoracic pressure and you should get a flowing of blood but that doesn't transmit to the to the left atrium but it does transmit to the right side so what you do get is you get lots of filling of the right side of the heart which starts diastole early so you get a big increase in size of the right ventricle which then bounces to the left and then as you exhale the reverse happens you then get filling of the left ventricle and then it bounces the other side so if you read septal bounce 
that's accentuated by inspiration, the answer is constrictive cosmopathy. I wouldn't even look at the rest of the option. That is your answer. That is basically pathognomonic. For the sake of the FRCR, that's pathognomonic. If they're nice enough to give you the fact that the pericardium is prominent, then you've also got your diagnosis. So you've got constrictive cardiomyopathy. Because remember, the most common cause of constrictive cardiomyopathy is pericardial thickening, usually calcified pericardial thickening. I think worldwide it's TB. Uh, but I think in the UK it's post-surgical. It's probably worth someone double-checking. I think it's post-surgical in the UK, usually post-cabbage. Um, is that clear? And the reason why C is not correct is because it tells you that LVEF and RVEF are normal. So anything above 55% for the sake of the exam is normal. Dilated cardiomyopathy, it has to tell you that the ventricle is dilated and it doesn't. Okay, So that's why they're not correct. So principles of LG. So this is important. Um, and this is the reason that you would do if they asked you a question, you would say that the answer is five to ten, it's usually ten minutes post LG. So when you give gadolinium, how long do you wait before you do late GAD imaging? And the answer is ten minutes, roughly. And the reason for that is that you can see in normal myocardium, there's a rapid wash in of GAD and a rapid washout. Whereas in infarcted myocardium, which is often the reason that you're doing LGE, there's a very slow wash in, but then it gets trapped. So if you were to image, do an LGE imaging at two minutes, normal myocardium would be the one that was bright and infarct would be low. And that's not what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to make the difference as great as possible. So this might not be the best chart to show it, but at this point, you've got increased amount of contrast enhancement within the infarct of myocardium at 10 minutes relative to everything else. So anything that's bright at 10 minutes is abnormal myocardium and is therefore infarcted tissue if it's subendocardial. And the same principle applies for subepicardial things. Um, so things like myocarditis or dilated cardiomyopathy that give you mid-wall enhancement, the principle is the same. That's best seen at 10 minutes. So for the exam, 10 minutes is when you're doing late GAD. So this is just as a visual aid. This is what cardiac amyloid looks like. You've got diffuse subendocardial myocardial enhancement that is not conforming to a coronary territory. OK, so that's the key. If this was subendocardial enhancement confined to a territory, then it is an infarct. If it is not confined to a territory for the sake of the exam, then this is amyloid. So we've just gone through that. So a 42-year-old male is brought in by ambulance with acute central chest pain with a raised troponin. He has non-regional ST and T wave changes. He is taken for a catheter angio which shows unobstructed coronary arteries. He has a cardiac MRI which shows T2, raised T2 values in the basal to mid-lateral wall and a thin rim of sub-epicardial enhancement in the basal lateral wall. What's the most likely diagnosis? So I'll give you a minute to think about that. The majority of you, only four of you have, I don't know, 10 of you. So 10 of you have said A, which is great. So this is a classic diagnosis of viral myocarditis. So remember, when someone comes in with acute chest pain and raised troponin, you're thinking, OK, it's either an MI or it's going to be myocarditis, or rarely it's going to be an acute presentation of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's usually your three differentials, um, although the latter is rare. So your first two things, you should think, OK, is this guy having an MI or is this guy having myocarditis? Um, obviously, in the grand, in reality, it's much more complicated. But for the exam, that's what you're looking for. No one's expecting you to be a cardiologist and no one's expecting you to make diagnoses based on history. 
so they've told you there's regional ST and T wave changes. Fine. That's non-specific. He's taken for an angio, which shows unobstructed coronaries. Okay, fine. So you know he's not having a big plaque in the coronary artery that has um, that has um, basically ruptured. And he's having a cardiac MRI, which shows raised T2 values and a thin rim of sub-epicardial enhancement. That pattern of enhancement is path is viral myocarditis until proven otherwise. Now, if I stopped the question here, unobstructed coronary arteries, then either A or B would be correct because you can have small plaques in angios that are missed and they could rupture and like pinch off and go to a very distal part of the LAD and you would notice it, you would see it, but you would be able to differentiate on cardiac MRI based on the pattern of LGE. So the fact that the pattern of LGE here is sub-epicardial, then that is a non-ischemic pattern whereas a embolic MI would be a sub-endocardial infarct and it would be an ischemic pattern of enhancement. So that's the importance. And this is the classic location. So again, easy exam question, what's the most common location for a viral myocarditis? It tends to be in the basal lateral wall and raised T2 values means that there is edema. So everything here is fitting with an acute on event. And if you take the history and the imaging, then the answer is viral myocarditis. Fabry's disease, the classic question is going to be mild LVH with lateral wall, mid wall enhancement, basal lateral wall, mid wall enhancement with LVH and they'll have to give you something else, something renal um, to tell you that this is Fabry's. So it's not going to be an acute presentation, it'll be an indolent presentation or a routine echo shows LVH, they have an MRI and it shows basal mid wall enhancement. Arrhythmogenic left ventricular cardiomyopathy is a relatively new entity that's not going to be in the exam, as in it won't be a diagnosis, could be an option. Dilated cardiomyopathy is a, has to give you the history. Chronic shortness of breath could present acutely with a decompensated event, but there will be something in the history that tells you the MRI will show a dilated left ventricle with septal mid-wall enhancement. So that's your pathognomonic findings. And remember, cardiac MR for the exam is going to be basic. It's not going to be complex, so they're not going to trick you. So it's going to be this guy's 60s come in with gradual shortness of breath with an acute exacerbation over the last 24 hours. The coronary arteries are unobstructed. You do a cardiac MRI and you notice the dilated left ventricle and mid-wall enhancement in the septum. One of the questions they could ask you is, is what is the prognostic indicator of dilated cardiomyopathy? And that's the extent and or the presence of LGE. So the presence of septal LGE is an adverse prognosis in dilated cardiomyopathy. This you just need to learn. This is not this is all you need to learn for LGE. There's no point me telling you it because this is in crack the core and it's done beautifully there. Um, you just need to learn this table. And that's all of the revision you need to do for um, LGE patterns. There's, they're not going to ask you anything outside that. So just learn that. This is high yield. I think we'll probably do this last question. I'm sure you guys are like probably falling asleep. Um, so 50 year old female has been referred for outpatient cardiac CT for the investigation of chest pain. Bedside investigation shows sinus rhythm, heart rate of 90 and BP of 100 over 60. She had had a previous stroke in 2019, but no relevant history of cardiac failure or valvular disease. Her medications include aspirin, cloppy, verapamil and simvastatin. You're asked by the radiographer to prescribe the necessary medications. Which of the following is recommended? So again, this will basically just test who's actually done cardiac CT and who hasn't. And remember, cardiac CT in the new curriculum is you're expected to be independent by the time you finish. So they're a bit being hot on this now. So I'll give you a minute. So it's a split bag between A and C so far. Majority of C, so yes, C is correct. So 
Verapamil is a calcium channel blocker that interacts with bisoprolol and can result in asystole. So if you ever see Verapamil in a cardiac CT question, you don't give um, metoprolol. GTN, the one they're going to look at is blood pressure. So anything less than 90, you don't give GTN. If they have Verapamil, you don't give metoprolol. Um, slightly more complicated than that, but this is the chart. So basically, um, asthma is a relative contraindication to beta blocker. I don't think they would ask that because I think that's too variable between different teams. Like I give beta blockers to asthma all the time. Um, so I don't think it's a fair question to ask that, but the others are, are not relative and they are factual. So second or third degree heart block for beta blockers, severe aortic stenosis or active heart failure. Varapamil, sinus bradycardia makes sense. You're not going to lower someone's heart rate if they've already got bradycardia. And then GTN, um, severe aortic stenosis. So think about it, severe aortic stenosis, your stroke volume, how much blood is getting out of the aorta is low. If you then give GTN and you dilate everything, your stroke volume is just going to crash and you'll have a collapse. So you don't give it an aortic stenosis and the same principle for HCM. HCM patients have left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. So again, not much blood is making its way through into the aorta. So if you then give a vasodilator like GTM, you reduce your stroke volume even more and you can increase your risk of collapse. Glaucoma is another contraindication. Sildenafil in the last 24 hours is an important one for GTM and we ask that for everyone. Um, and obviously a systole blood pressure of less than 90. So there are a few more, but I think we should probably call it a day unless there is appetite. Well, let me see if any of them. This is on coronary territories. That's quite. I'll just do this one actually because this one is something that everyone gets wrong. A 21 year old patient was referred to cardiology with a pansystolic murmur heard at the left lower sternal edge. Echo shows the presence of a perimembranous ventricular septal defect. Which cardiac chamber will enlarge first? And this is, don't worry, because everyone gets this wrong. I used to get this wrong. If you know it, great. If you don't, then I'll hopefully explain it to you and you'll never forget it again. So as many of you should uh, can answer it if you can, because it'll be interesting to see what your understanding of where these things are, and then it'll help how much I can tailor it to. So I'm just going to give you all a minute. So the majority are saying C, which is what I had expected. But this is covered really well in Crack the Core. Um, So four of you have said A, one B, ten C. Okay, I think that's probably enough time. So the answer is A. So the reason why that is is here. Yeah. So when you have a perimembranous, okay, perimembranous septal defect, what is happening is blood is going from your left ventricular outflow tract into your pulmonary trunk okay so the first chamber so remember so blood goes from left ventricular outflow tract to right ventricular outflow tract it then goes into the pulmonary artery it then goes into the pulmonary vein and then it goes into the left atrium. So the first chamber that gets the most amount of blood is the left atrium. And it's all about knowing the location of the, the shunt. So if you had a muscular VSD, so between the left, between the muscles of the left and the right, you're going to have a defect here. So you see where it says muscular, you'll see you have a defect here. Therefore, in that situation, you'd get the right ventricle would enlarge the most because blood would be going from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. So the first chamber that gets the most blood is the right ventricle. That's in a muscular VSD. In a perimembranous VSD, the defect is at the level of the outflow tract. So the blood goes from the RVOT, uh, LVOT into the RVOT. So here, 
then goes into the pulmonary trunk, then goes into the lungs, pulmonary veins, and into the left atrium. So the first chamber to enlarge in a perimembranous VST is the left atrium. And this is a little basic thingy that you can just learn. PDA is the same principle. Blood goes from the aortic arch, from the defect through the PDA into the right vent, um, pulmonary artery. So therefore the first chamber to enlarge is the left atrium because it goes pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, left atrium. And I think that is enough because I'm sure you're tired. But um, if you guys have specific topics that you want me to go through, then you can speak to the chaps who organise the SRT and we can try and sort something out last minute before your exams. I think I'll hand over to Jordan or whoever else is running the show.